If someone told me when I was a kid that I would be filming a video as an adult about Metamucil, the type of fiber I would see my grandfather stirring into water before chugging it down for reasons that were unbeknownst to me at the time, I would have been really concerned about my future. But I have to say that with age comes wisdom, and as a GI dietitian specializing in IBS, I have a newfound appreciation for Metamucil and the fiber that it contains, which is called psyllium husk. It's a type of fiber that comes from a plant called the Plantago ovata plant, and just so happens to be one of those fiber types that may be particularly helpful in IBS. So today we're going to be talking about the properties of psyllium, also called espagala. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. Uh, we're going to talk about the properties of psyllium that make it favorable for IBS. And then we're also going to talk about what psyllium may do to help improve IBS symptoms based off of the research that's been done on psyllium in IBS populations. And then finally, we'll talk about how to take psyllium. So what is it about the properties of psyllium that makes it a well-tolerated and attractive fiber option in IBS? Something that's important to understand is that fiber types are not created equal when it comes to the functional properties that they have and how those different functional properties impact how tolerable the fiber is or the different health impacts that one might expect from consuming that type of fiber. So the functional properties of psyllium that are particularly attractive for IBS are that psyllium is a minimally fermented fiber that also has the ability to become viscous and form a gel in the presence of fluids. Now, what's the relevance of those functional properties as it pertains to IBS? Now, when it comes to psyllium being a minimally fermented fiber, the benefit of that is that fibers that are fermented by our resident gut microbes can often lead to the production of gases just by nature of that fermentation process. And so a minimally fermented fiber is not going to lead to as much gas production, which can be important for reducing symptoms in IBS that are common, like bloating or even abdominal pain. The other benefit of psyllium being a minimally fermented fiber is that it allows for psyllium husk to make it to the lower regions of our GI tract in our colon without being broken down by different microbes, meaning that it is structurally intact and able to potentially help with regulating bowel movements. And when it comes to regulating bowel movements, that could theoretically extend both to constipation and diarrhea in IBS. And I say theoretically because as you'll see pretty soon, the evidence is sparse in that area. But the reason for that is related to that soluble, viscous, gel-forming nature of psyllium. And that's because psyllium's interaction with fluids in our bowels can make a really big difference in stool form because a lot of stool form is related to water content. So for instance, the average normal stool has about 74% water content, whereas hard stools have 72% and loose stools have 76% or greater when it comes to the water content. So as little as a 2% difference in the water content of your stool can make a huge difference in your stool form and also your satisfaction with your bowel movements. So because psyllium is able to retain water and potentially form this gel-like matrix that might be helpful in diarrhea as that could allow for psyllium to sop up some additional water, lessening the water content of stool and helping to improve stool viscosity and form. Now on the other side of the spectrum, if somebody is experiencing constipation in IBS and they are having these lower water content stools that are hard and harder to pass, then psyllium might be helpful here as well because it can collect and retain water and its gel-like matrix may help to improve the stool viscosity as well in this case, making it to where stool is easier to propel through the bowels and also easier to pass. Now, again, of course, we still need more studies to validate these bowel habit regulation benefits in IBS as it pertains to psyllium. But I will say that the minimally fermented nature of psyllium can be helpful in IBS from the perspective of not provoking symptoms, and that the viscous, gel-forming, water-holding capacity of psyllium does have therapeutic potential for regulating bowel movements. Before we continue, I want to quickly tell you about ibsprobiotics.org. So this started out as a research project, but then we ended up turning it into this really cool comparison tool. When you go on the site, you can easily compare which probiotics were most effective for different IBS symptoms all exclusively based off of clinical studies. In fact, we spent the past two years building it, having analyzed over 50 different probiotics across more than 75 placebo-controlled trials. And the results surprised us. For example, we found that some really popular probiotics were nowhere near as effective as some lesser-known options, and there were even some probiotics that seemed to do more harm than good. 
So I hope this free tool helps you to cut through the marketing hype and saves you a ton of time when evaluating a probiotic. Now, when it comes to the benefits of psyllium that have been seen in the research, there have been several meta-analyses that have concluded that psyllium may help to improve IBS symptoms. And these meta-analyses form the basis for the recommendations that we see from professional organizations such as the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology, which explicitly recommends the therapeutic use of psyllium for IBS symptoms. And perhaps less directly, we also see psyllium making an appearance in the American College of Gastroenterology recommendations that were put out in 2021, where they recommend soluble but not insoluble fiber use for IBS. Now, I will say there are definitely some limitations to that phrasing that we won't get into today as far as functional properties of fiber go, but the basis of that soluble fiber recommendation primarily came from evidence related to psyllium. So given those recommendations, we wanted to dive into the evidence for psyllium and IBS ourselves just to see what exactly psyllium may be helping to improve as far as IBS goes. And so we were able to identify nine controlled trials, seven of which we could access. One, we couldn't really draw conclusions from because the results were majorly confounded by this factorial design in the study. But of those studies, five were done in a adults and two were done in children. Now, to be totally blunt here, the evidence quality on psyllium and IBS is honestly pretty crappy. A lot of the studies were small in population size and they were coming from the 1970s up through the early 2000s for the most part. And the studies would look at different symptom parameters as far as looking to assess, you know, what psyllium improved in this study versus this one. So it was really hard to make apples to apples comparisons. So we cannot be overly confident about any of these effects of psyllium. There were eight different symptoms and parameters that we want to bring to your attention here, with the most consistent finding from psyllium studies in IBS being for global symptom improvement. So we found four studies that evaluated some form of a global IBS symptom marker, and of those, three seemed to show significant improvement, while one did not show any sort of significant improvement over placebo. The findings for abdominal pain-related measurements were not as consistent, so we found six studies that looked at some sort of pain-related parameter. Of those, three seem to show significant improvement in some capacity, whereas three did not. There were two studies that looked at bowel movement frequency and bowel transit times. Of these two studies, one seemed to show an increase in bowel movement frequency and transit time, whereas one found no changes. And these differences could be related to some differences in the study populations evaluated, as well as some differences in the doses and frequencies in which psyllium was taken. One study assessed satisfaction with bowel movements and did find a significant improvement. And interestingly, this was actually in a population primarily of individuals reporting diarrhea as a primary complaint, though there was no sort of subtype specific information or analysis. When it comes to constipation and diarrhea as it pertains to stool form, two studies analyzed these parameters, both of which did not find significant improvements in stool form for either diarrhea or constipation. For bloating and distension, two studies evaluated this parameter with one finding significant improvement, whereas the other one did not find a significant change. And finally, two studies evaluated scores for quality of life, with one study finding significant improvement and the other not finding a significant change. So what do we take from all of this? I think it's pretty clear that the evidence for how psyllium might impact IBS symptoms is mixed, with the most consistent finding being for the improvement of global IBS symptoms. So how do you take psyllium for IBS? In the clinical trials we observed, the doses ranged from 4 grams per day up to 30 grams per day. For adults, the doses that seemed to be most effective were those in the 10 to 30 gram per day range. So for those aged 12 and above, we would suggest a dose range of 10 to 30 grams per day provided in divided doses, where each dose ranges from about 2.5 grams to 7.5 grams of psyllium. For children ages 6 to 12, the effective dose seemed to be about 6 grams per day. And again, we recommend providing that in divided doses of 2.5 to 3.75 grams per dose. The duration of intake of psyllium from one study to the next ranged from about 4 to 12 weeks. So we would suggest a minimum trial time of around 4 weeks to see if maybe it could be beneficial for you if you get the green light from your medical provider to do so. And for the sake of tolerance, we would suggest starting with just 25% of your target dose 
and then gradually working your way up until you're hitting your target daily dose. Now, for the sake of safety, you should definitely always do those divided doses like we mentioned before, and also take psyllium with at least eight ounces of fluid because there have been case reports of esophageal obstructions and even suffocation from taking psyllium and it's swelling in the throat. So definitely want to chase it down with plenty of water for safety purposes. A few other safety things, never put a dry psyllium in the back of your throat. Like don't empty a sachet into the back of your throat, mix it with water first. And you're going to want to take psyllium at least one hour before or up to two to four hours after taking any kind of medications as it could interact with different medications and slow down their rate of absorption. The form of psyllium you take is totally up to your preference as long as you're hitting those target doses and following those dosing instructions. It comes in capsules. It also comes in flavored products like Metamucil, or you can even just get plain psyllium husk in a powder form. The one thing to be aware of when it comes to capsules is that they contain usually around 500 milligrams per capsule. So to take the dose that's been shown to be effective for adults with IBS, you'd have to take a lot of capsules. I'm talking like 20 plus. So that probably wouldn't be my first choice personally. And finally, if you have any questions for us about this video, or if you would like to share your personal experience for how psyllium helped or didn't help your IBS symptoms, please feel free to leave a comment below. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching this video. And as a quick reminder, don't forget to check out ibsprobiotics.org. We're really proud of this research project turned comparison tool that we've made. And of course, it is free and publicly available. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest IBS research, you can follow me here. See you next time.